Okay, I'm going to walk you through what I'm thinking when I read Living Like Weasels. As always, remember that everyone's interpretation is a little bit different, so I'm going to pick up on some things you may not have picked up on, and you might notice some things that I don't highlight here in the audio recording. That's okay, but my focus is going to be language, and when I analyze a piece, language and structure are always the places that I start because they really are the most important things. I'm going to look at this opening paragraph and notice how much language is really violent and instinctual. He talks about, or she talks about stalking and killing and dragging the carcasses. All of these things remind me of very visceral imagery, obedient to instinct, biting, splitting the jugular. And I can't emphasize enough, this is a great example where verbs are your friends. Verbs will help set the tone more than anything else that you can do. But as I go through the rest of the paragraph, I see this kill imagery and I think of nature and wild and instinctual things. The author then transitions to an anecdote, not of her own, but again, of one that is very natural. So we're kind of living in that. A weasel fixed by the jaws, swiveled and bit. Airborne bones, talons, gutting the living weasel. So we're continuing with that language. So if someone were to ask me what the tone is at this point, of course I would say it's a very violent tone, an aggressive tone. Then we see a shift to first person. I have been thinking about weasels. So we start anecdotally, but she's not in the picture so much. If we go back up to the top, it's really the definition of a weasel, what a weasel is. She's setting the backdrop, and then we see a shift. And you'll hear me talk about shifts over and over again because they matter. Suddenly we're really invited in when she says, I've been thinking. The language also changes. I startled a weasel who startled me. And then we go into a very peaceful and beautiful description of this farm and the area that she's living in, covering two acres, the nesting pair of wood ducks, the muskrat hole. Suddenly, nature doesn't seem so aggressive anymore. Instead, it's the landscape. The verbs are also a little bit more peaceful, too. She walked. She was watching. And a yellow warbler appeared. So in this section here, we see a definite shift in tone. So I want you also to think about why the voice shifts. Why does she change language? Then as we move further, weasel, exclamation point. Again, another shift in tone. She's bringing the opening and her backdrop, backdrop together. Weasel, I had never seen one wild before. So we have that language coming up again. His face was fierce. His face would have made a good arrowhead. So there's that really, really kind of violent language, but it's part of the landscape. When the two meet, the weasel was stunned into stillness. I was stunned into stillness. So we see these parallels immediately. She and the weasel are experiencing the same thing, obviously as two very different creatures. Our eyes locked. Lovers or deadly enemies. Again, it's that really strange comparison of the same but different. You see a juxtaposition there. A bright blow to the brain. A sudden beating of brains. We still have that angry imagery, that violent imagery. It felled the forest, drained the pond, dismantled, tumbled. If you were writing a formal analysis, language would have to be one of the key focuses. Sure, you could pull out the imagery and other things, but you could also really hone in on those verbs and say she is picking them specifically to set that tone. As she moves on through, he disappeared and things start to settle down a little bit. I waited motionless. I've been in the weasel's brain. He was in mine. And she starts to go into thinking versus the physical actions, talking about what the weasel was thinking about. And she decides that he has a clear kind of empty head. And so what's preoccupying her is that mindlessness, that living by instinct. I really like this line. His journal is tracks in clay, a spray of feathers, mouse blood and bone, uncollected, unconnected, loose leaf and blown. I think that word unconnected is really important, especially considering she's contrasting the weasel to herself. And as human beings, we are pretty connected most of the time. So I think here she's drawing a line between the two of them. 
And then we see a shift again. I would like to learn or remember how to live. The violent language is put away, and instead we see self-reflection. I come to Holland Pond not to so much to learn how to live as frankly to forget about it. That is, I don't think I can learn from a wild animal how to live in particular, but I might learn something of mindlessness. The language becomes more peaceful, more thoughtful. We have purity, mindlessness, necessity. She's not saying she wants to be the weasel for sure, but she is saying what can we learn? And there's also an openness there that she's not just rolling over nature as man unfortunately often does, but instead she's saying when we step back, when we're confronted with what nature can be, what do we do? And I've said this before, but often you'll find that moment where the author shows their cards and says this is really what it's all about. This is the paragraph where that happens. And again, noting that there's a shift in tone in language matters because that's how the author lets us know instead of saying this is my point. She changes things up so that we notice a change in language and a change in the rhythm of the piece. Moving to the end, I missed my chance. I should have gone for the throat. I should have lunged. So again, that language is being brought back, pulsed into my gut through a jugular. Could two live that way? Talking about the idea of whether or not two people could live in this mindlessness, in this peace. She sang probably not. We could, you know, we can live any way we want. People take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, even of silence by choice. Again, there's a key point there. She's saying that individually, if we wanted, we could make that choice. Would most people want to live like a weasel? Probably not. But that language and playing with I and we, inviting us in to her thoughts, is really important. Then we see that shift to second person. The thing is to stalk your calling. Again, look at those beautiful verbs. To stalk your calling in a certain skilled and supple way. You'll probably notice a lot of alliteration throughout. Stalk, skilled, and supple. That's definitely in there too. But for me, it's all about her language. This is yielding, not fighting. And to me, that encompasses the entire essay. This idea that she sees this weasel feels like they're going to fight and then the weasel just turns because instinctually it's not going to fight a human being it just keeps going on but the encounter resonates with her it stays with her and again most good authors at the end will have this lovely wrap-up i think it would be well and proper and obedient and pure to grasp your one necessity and not let it go again shifting from what she thinks to almost a call to action what you should do and I really like how she ends it. This last sentence really, really wraps up everything nicely. Seize it and let it seize you up aloft even till your bones burn out and drop. Let your musky flesh fall off in shreds and let your bones unhinge and scatter. Loosened over fields, over fields and woods, lightly, thoughtless from any height at all, from as high as eagles. Suddenly, that story she told at the beginning about a weasel hanging onto an eagle's neck so tight that it was up in the air parallels to the ending. And often, personal anecdotes aren't just thrown in, but they kind of wrap up and they fit with the ending. She did an excellent job. I call it bookending. You have the story at the beginning, and suddenly the story, if it wasn't already meaningful to us, becomes really meaningful. If I was doing a rhetorical analysis, for sure the audience are people who don't appreciate or think about nature, but more importantly, the idea of being focused on one task. We live in the age of multitaskers, so I think she's really speaking to people who maybe should step back and try to focus on one thing. What is it like just to live without all of the worries and the extra things we pile on during the day? The situation, the reason she's writing it, certainly has to do with her being out in the woods, but also the state of the world. And her message is that we should really, really think about what nature can do for us, but also what our purpose is, what we approach in life. And then her purpose is to get us to consider that and perhaps change it. As always, if you have any questions, let me know, and I hope this was helpful.